come on. All right, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top, beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization now on... Where are we already? Thursday, February 5th, 2020, or somewhere like that, here in the paradise of Garfield, Texas. And I am Sam Mitchell, and this is Collapse Chronicles, and this is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza. <coughs> so, uh, on this absolutely beautiful day, what I get to do with myself is head to Home Depot for more stuff, more stuff, and continue with the painting job from hell. So I'm going to ruin this beautiful day. But before I dive into that, uh, do what I do every day. That is to chronicle the collapse of global industrial civilization and the planet. And guys, uh, as embarrassed as I am on one level to do this, I'm going to bring you another story on the only story on the planet which, of course, is the coronavirus, or whatever they call it now, with the number 19 at the end of it. Uh, I am s c completely sick and tired of the coronavirus. But So, what I talk about on this channel, I guess, is not the virus, okay? It is the reaction to the virus, which I call corona fever. And which is a much bigger story for what's going on down here than the virus itself. That, as I've said before, and we're getting ready to illustrate, that what's going on, the reaction to what I consider a bad hair day, uh, the reaction from the, the entire planet, uh, is, is a perfect snapshot into the future of what it's going to look like as more and more things like the coronavirus, maybe when a real one shows up, as more and more of these things start appearing in our lives, and more importantly, as more and more, <clears throat> who I term the clueless morons, or the sheeple, uh, as we see in this story, start to understand that this house of cards is coming down, how just everybody is going to react, and particularly how governments are going to react as the citizens of the various countries and of the planet start to understand that we ain't coming out of this one, that the house of cards is coming down, this civilization is coming down, uh, the society is turning into Mad Max. Uh, the human species and the planet not far behind. And you are going to see, the, and, and these are just a little bit of a peek into the reaction. And uh, I think three of you have sent me this. Well, the little dog cannot. I wish you could see what I'm sitting in the middle of, guys. So we're going to hear... Several of you have <clears throat> sent me uh, this, uh, at the, this most recent essay from Tim Watkins, who I have had the pleasure of interviewing. You really need to look up my interview with Tim Watkins, who has, he's over there from England, and has his website is called The Consciousness of Sheep. The Consciousness of Sheep. And there is no story I have ever encountered in 12 years down here in this rabbit hole that illustrates the consciousness of sheep, the sheeple, what I term the clueless morons, uh, that this article here on coronavirus, uh, which he titles, What Are We, or Rather They, Planning For? And so I'm going to put the link in... You can read the whole article. I'm not going to read the first half, which is just a eye rolling in the back of my head rehash. What starts it? It, it sound. I, I thought at first that Tim Watkins had just bought in to the the mainstream media. Uh, 
story being cooked up here by what I call the Ministry of Truth from 1984 here in 2019, but we're going to pick up with a quote from uh, some fellow, I don't know who he is, Adam Wren, writing at Medium. I have been paywalled out of Medium, so uh, I could not read this whole article, but this is what Tim <coughs> chose to write as a segue into the bigger question of what are we, or rather they, planning for. Take it away, Adam Wren, to open. Quote, the main risk of the coronavirus outbreak is not that you are going to get sick and die. It is that so many people are going to get so quickly that our health care services and infrastructure are going to be completely overwhelmed. Again, just I'm not necessarily agreeing with this. I'm just saying what other voices out there are saying. If the present data about the virus is correct, even at conservative estimates, we are going to have hundreds of thousands of people needing hospitalization and intensive care. The strain that this will place on the health care system cannot be overstated. We are not prepared to deal with a pandemic. Close quote. And you better believe when a real pandemic uh, arrives on this planet, we will see that sentence. This is, we are not prepared to deal with a bad hair day. Okay? Wait, wait till a real one shows up on the block. Anyway, so back to Tim Watkins. <clears throat> Which brings us to the question in the title of this post, what are we, or rather they, planning for? And so remember, he's from England, so he talks specifically about the UK, but you can take whatever he says about the UK and extrapolate it to any government on the planet when they are threatened. In fact, the UK government paper actually tells us albeit on page 19, where it is likely to go unnoticed by journalists who usually merely reprint the accompanying press release, <clears throat> quote, If transmission of the virus becomes established in the UK population, the nature and scale of the response will change. The chief focus will be to provide essential services helping those most at risk to access the right treatment, close quote. <coughs> Back to Tim. <clears throat> there are two clauses in that second sentence which need to be treated separately. The first one, the chief focus will be to provide essential services, close quote, is the primary purpose of all emergency planning which developed out of preparations for the impact of nuclear war in the aftermath of the Second World War. The aim was not, as many believed, to ensure survival, but to ensure survivability. These two terms were used interchangeably by journalists during the Cold War, but survivability refers to the survival of the command and control mechanisms of the state in the aftermath of a nuclear strike or nuclear strike, global pandemic, climate change, whatever. Um, that is, after the Soviet Union had unloaded its nuclear arsenal on us, somewhere in a deep bunker or a submarine would be someone with the means to give the order to retaliate. In the years since the Cold War, survivability has morphed into maintaining the command and control structures of the state in the face of any form of disaster or threat. And so, the primary purpose of government efforts to mitigate the spread of coronavirus will be to protect 
the state and maintain essential infrastructure and economic activity. That is exactly uh, what it's going to be. It's going to be to maintain their grip on power, which is why, of course, saving the people is diluted to, quote, helping those most at risk. Given the tiny number of beds relative to the likely spread of the disease, this, inevit this inevitably means triage, the Napoleonic military approach which divided wounded soldiers into three groups. I often wondered where the try and triage came from. Number one, those with minor injuries that could be easily patched up. Number two, those with more serious wounds who would recover with treatment. And number three, those with wounds so serious they were likely to die anyway. So let them die. <clears throat> the second group, those with more serious wounds who would recover with treatment, were the only ones who received medical treatment. The first would be given dressings and left to deal with their own injuries. The last group would be put somewhere out of sight while they awaited the uh, imminent arrival of the Grim Reaper. Exactly what we can look forward to in a pandemic, and I'm talking about when a real pandemic gets here, exactly what we can look forward to in a pandemic depends on two broad factors. The first concerns the disease itself. If it continues to spread as rapidly as coronavirus has thus far, and especially if the onset of spring fails to slow it, then there is simply no way in which the National Health Service, even if the government is able to return retired medical staff to active duty, can hope to hospitalize everyone who needs care. The second concerns the availability of resources, especially human resources, both to deal with the direct medical impacts of the virus and with the socioeconomic fallout as large numbers of people get sick. And again, I continue to reiterate when we get a real virus, this is uh, where these words are going to kick in. In this, we can only hope, we can only hope that our government has more detailed plans in the paper which is being circulated for public consumption because our Achilles heel in this is that neoliberal economic system that we have created over the last four decades leaves us particularly vulnerable to second-order failures of which a shortage of hospital beds is just one. Put simply, <clears throat> the policies introduced to allow the economy to continue growing after the energy and economic crises of the 1970s traded resilience for complexity. As David Karowitz explains, quote, this is a long quote, I'm not sure who David is, but he has a link to the full article, quote, Our ability to sustain our basic needs anywhere now depends on system integration everywhere. That means no infrastructure, society, or country can be fully resilient as the conditions that maintain function are dispersed beyond visibility or control. Because society depends upon multiple interacting networks within cities and across the globe, there are many routes to cascading disruption. This is an example of non-linearity, 
a relatively small number of directly impacted people or functions can still cause the failure of a whole system. The speed of our societal processes from just-in-time logistics to financial transactions means that shocks can rapidly cascade. We can think of society as an ecosystem with keystone species providing the structural anchors through which society functions. Such keystones include critical infrastructure, read the grid, telecommunications, water and sanitation, etc., the financial system, societal cohesion, supply chains, and environmental inputs, read food, oil, water, etc. There are also these are also interdependent with each other. If you remove any one of them, the others will topple. This allows us to see other paths toward systemic failure, close quote. I'm thinking I should have read uh, that essay by David. Uh, I'm going to come back tomorrow and read that entire essay. Back to Tim. It is, <clears throat> back to Tim, it is highly doubtful that the British government can replicate the Chinese state and lock down entire regions while building a new 1,000 bed hospital in a week. It usually takes the best part of a decade for the British to conduct the obligatory planning inquiry. In any case, Medical shortages are just one weak link in the many services that governments that government is responsible for providing us. If, as they say, 20% of the workforce is going to be off sick at the same time, there is a serious threat to our entire critical infrastructure. The BBC has an interview with a woman from Singapore who has recovered from coronavirus describing the experience of the disease. Even a milder version may leave people debilitated for several days and in any case they will be discouraged, probably with legal sanctions, from returning to work until they have fully recovered. What this means is that more or less randomly, six and a half million or so of the normally active UK workforce will be incapacitated. That includes, for example, the people who operate your local nuclear power station, railway signal staff, national grid operators, water and sewage system engineers, telecommunications workers, air traffic controllers, port pilots, and a host of other specialists for whom there is no replacement down at the local job center. Even sickness among relatively routine workforces may prove seriously disruptive. What happens to local food supplies if supermarket workers become sick or regional depots have to shut down? How might we access information in the event that data centers and media newsrooms are forced to close? There are practical concerns here too. Accessing food could be a serious issue for the tens of thousands of people who rely on food banks. The food banks themselves depend upon donations by supermarkets and supermarket shoppers, but neither is likely to be well disposed to donating food in the event that national food supplies are disrupted as the result of a virus. Money is also an issue for the millions at the base of the income ladder. The government has now confirmed that someone who isolated themselves to prevent the spread of the virus will qualify as being sick for the purpose of statutory sick pay. 
However, since this is just $94.25 per week compared to the $3.28 minimum wage, millions of the lowest paid workers will have a strong incentive to continue to work while sick, at least until their condition deteriorates or unless the state uses force to prevent them from working. And even sick pay may not be available if bank data centers go down and electronic transfers cannot be made. The planning paper issued to the public today is less a comprehensive plan than a PR paper designed to prepare the population for state powers being deployed if and when the spread of coronavirus grows to the point that it threatens the running of the state and critical infrastructure and not to belabor the point it's not going to happen with coronavirus but it is going to happen uh, pretty soon while it makes some reassuring noises about maintaining health care services it also indicates the introduction of triage both to people falling ill and to service delivery. It also contains the not so veiled threat of police and special courts to enforce quarantines and rationing that the public would be unlikely to accept in normal times. In the end, however, the true threat that the, the true threat comes not from coronavirus or from the potentially draconian state response to its spread. The true threat is from the highly vulnerable global economy that we have collectively chosen to build in response to energy, environmental, and economic crises that have been growing worse for the past 50 years that can no longer be remedied. Amen. Uh, Tim Watkins. So, uh, once again, guys, it really doesn't matter what your opinion on the coronavirus is. Who was it? That guy, that sportscaster who got in all that trouble for saying opinions are, are like anuses. We all like to, uh, we all have one, but nobody... Or was it opinions? Uh, anyway, I can't, but I know what he's saying. We, we can sit here and we can talk till we're blue in the face. Everybody on the planet is an expert on coronavirus. Uh, you can, you know, nobody knows where this uh, one is going. Uh, but whether this one is the big kahuna, and I don't believe it is, the big kahuna is on its way. And you better believe that 1984 will spring into full action when it gets here. And I cannot think of a better uh, snapshot of our future, uh, the collapse of civilization and what's unfolding. Uh, on this planet. But anyway, if you enjoyed what Tim Watkins had to say about the real threat of the coronavirus, please spend a few seconds to thumb it up. If you did not like what Tim Watkins had to tell you, thumb it down and please spend a few seconds over here subscribing to Collapse Chronicles for more doom and gloom. But right now, i got to wrap up today's Chronicle of the Collapse on this spectacularly gorgeous day to head to Home Depot so I can keep painting to sell my house on a floodplain in Texas. And I encourage you to get out there on this gorgeous day here in the Collapse and enjoy it while you still can. What do you have? Do you have ear mites? Jesus. Starting to warm up. Ear mite season is upon us. 
Bye, guys.